Uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, thank you for those of you who've, who've turned out. This, this session was due to take place um, yesterday, but of course the, uh, the typhoon blew it away. Um, so um, I know that a lot of people can't be here in person, but in fact are here on Facebook. So hello to the Facebook um, audience. Nice to uh, see you in virtual form. Um, and sadly, uh, my um, co-presenter um, is not able to attend either, so I'm afraid it's just me. Um, Nick Groom this evening, and then I'll be introducing our next speaker um, after, after that, Edward Wilson Lee. So I'm here to talk about um, 400 years of Shakespeare, 400 years of the first folio, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. So you've probably heard of somebody called William Shakespeare, have you? Yes, good. <laughs> okay, we're off to a good start. And people think of Shakespeare as a playwright. He wrote plays. He was a dramatist, and the plays were performed in a number of theatres. Um, the, uh, this is the Globe Theatre, which uh, has, been, has been rebuilt. Um, it was, he, he also performed plays at the Curtain and, and um, later in his career at the Rose Theatre. Uh, the Globe Theatre, you'll see, um, is quite large. It's circular. Um, it has uh, an open roof. Um, so if you went to, to see a play there, you'd want to make sure uh, that it wasn't uh, pouring with the rain. Um, so the, uh, the cheaper tickets uh, were actually standing in front of the stage where you could get rained upon. More expensive ones in the balconies and the very expensive ones actually on the stage itself. So everybody could see how much money um, you had. Now, this doesn't mean that Shakespeare's plays were only written for the stage. I come in. Uh, because, in fact, the plays proved popular and it very quickly became apparent that there was also a reading audience for Shakespeare's plays. People wanted to have souvenirs. They wanted to have their own copies of the text so maybe they could read them through, they could imagine them being performed, they could remember them being performed, they could perhaps even stage their own particular performances. So you have the production in Shakespeare's lifetime, pretty early on, of what are called quartos. These are small, cheap, single play editions. Now why are they called quartos? Because they were made from a piece of paper folded into four. So that would present you with the pages. So you would have these bound together, um, a few of these gatherings, and you would then have pages one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, there was definitely a market for these. This is a quarto of Hamlet. And this is another quarto of Hamlet. This quarto, this souvenir version, was produced because this one had already been produced unofficially. This is a bootleg. This is a pirate. This is an illegal version. It begins, stand, who is that? The official version begins, who's there? So this was perhaps the, the what's called the bad quarto, the, uh, the quarto that was done unofficially, was perhaps done by a member of the company who was trying to remember things, possibly even by somebody standing in the audience, writing it down as it was being performed. But it does show that there's definitely a market, and you do get some very interesting variations in these bad quarters. So there's definitely, in other words, not only a market for Shakespeare's plays as physical objects, as editions, but as reading texts. So from the very beginning, Shakespeare was a playwright who was writing for the stage and for a readership as well. And that's really what we're celebrating this year, which is the anniversary of what's called the first folio. So, after Shakespeare more or less retires from the stage, returns to Stratford, he appears uh, to start collecting and editing his works uh, for a complete edition. Now this was a very um, ambitious thing to do. 
because as I say, previously these plays are only printed in small, cheap editions, but to produce a large hardback and um, you say illustrated with a picture of him uh, was really making a claim that he was a very serious writer. There's only one person who'd done this before Shakespeare, that was Ben Jonson, Shakespeare's friend, also a playwright and a poet. Now, the first folio is published in 1623, because Shakespeare died in 1616, so it's seven years after his death. So it appears that he was working on this um, and then sadly died, and two of his friends, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, then took up the, the papers and produced this um, text. And why is it called a folio? Well, if that's more or less a quarto, the folio is just a single sheet, which is folded into two. One sheet, folded into two like that. And this is actually, this is a folio in sixes, sorry, in threes. Um, so you have three sheets um, together. And that's how the pages were gathered together. Now this is, uh, leads to some problems. Because that's page one, that's page two, that's page 11, and that's page 12. So when you're printing it, you've got to be anticipating the length of the text. So you often find, and particularly with a play like Measure for Measure, that the gatherings in the, sorry, the, 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 uh, the, the leaves in the middle so that's um, five and six, for example. The text might be very squeezed up or very spaced out because they haven't anticipated, they haven't planned sufficiently to um, get the spacing correct. Because this, this is a substantial volume containing many plays. But that's why it's called a folio. And it was published in about 750 copies in 1623. So it's a substantial statement of Shakespeare's cultural and literary significance, but it's also unbelievably important. And there he is, sorry, there, because it contains 36 plays, and 18 had never been published before. So 18 did not exist in quarto. All's well, Anthony Cleopatra, as you like it, Comedy of Errors, Coriolanus, Cymbeline, Henry VI, Part One, Henry VIII, Julius Caesar, King John, Macbeth, Macbeth, Measure for Measure, The Taming of the Shrew, The Tempest, Time of Athens, Twelfth Night, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, and The Winter's Tale. So without the first folio, we would not have a play such as Macbeth. No other versions have been um, discovered. So the Shakespeare canon of plays would be half the size, in fact less than half the size for various other reasons, uh, than it currently is. So it's an extremely significant publication. So it gathers the plays together, publishes them in a single volume as a statement of Shakespeare's cultural um, significance. Now, major libraries, such as the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which was trying to collect every printed work at the time, didn't bother to get the quartos. These are cheap, ephemeral. Nobody's going to be interested in these plays in a few years' time. So the major research libraries across the world do not have... I mean, the quartos are incredibly scarce. If you ever find one in a second-hand shop, tell me. <laughs> I mean, often there are only you know, one, maybe two copies. But uh, when, the, uh, when the first folio was published, the Bodleian uh, realised that this was a significant work, very popular work, and actually bought a copy and had it on a lectern in the reading room so people could just pop into the library and then have a look at their favourite plays, their favourite bits, such as the balcony scene from Romeo and, and Juliet. So, you might think, well, that's all you know, well and good. Shakespeare's plays are gathered and collected, and the first folio 
sums up his achievement. But this has further significance, um, I think. And we need a little bit of history here, which is um, that 19 years later, the English Civil War breaks out. Extremely bloody and brutal war. King Charles I is executed in 1649, and that leads to the English Commonwealth, presided over initially by Oliver Cromwell. That's him there. Uh, warts and all, literally warts and all. That's where the phrase comes from. Um, and among other things, the theatres were closed. So theatre companies were closed down, actors were uh, redundant, no plays were performed. The various other things, such as uh, the banning of Christmas, uh, many festivities, customs, traditions were, were done away with. This was literally a very puritanical um, government. But it didn't last. And in 1660, Charles II, the son of Charles I, was restored to the throne and reopened the theatres. And what are the new theatre companies going to do? The Duke's men and the King's men, they're going to try to perform plays that used to be popular. What's the most convenient thing they can do? Get a copy of Shakespeare's folio. You've got the complete set there. You've got 36 plays. You've got a whole repertoire. You're not going to go looking around in the basements of um, old theatres and old uh, actors' uh, lofts and attics and so forth to try to find rare plays. You've already got 36 national plays that can be performed. So in other words, by collecting them together, by printing um, not only um, the 750 copies of the first print run, but subsequent editions as a subsequent edition in, in 1632, it meant that you had a ready-made repertoire. So the physical status of the first folio as a book, as a collected book, is really significant. But they did not perform the plays as they were written in the first folio, because a lot had happened, it had a civil war, taste had changed, this was a different context, a much more um, lordly court, smaller theatres, women on stage for the first time. And so playwrights adapted these plays, such as Nahum Tate, adapting the King Lear to give it a happy ending. <laughs> now, we think that's laughable um, today, uh, but in fact, this um, tradition of rewriting Shakespeare for the stage to make it much more palatable, much more sentimental, uh, much more acceptable to an audience, continues through the 18th century with somebody like David Garrick, who's a very significant um, actor-manager, um, really pioneered a whole new form of acting, very fast, naturalistic acting, lots of gestures, as you can see here, um, also pioneered the use of period costume, for example, uh, but also rewrote the plays. It didn't stop in the 18th century. It carries on into the 19th century, and even classic films, um, such as Olivier's Henry V, the film of that, from the mid-20th century, has lines from Garrick and Nahum Tate and other adapters, such as Colley Sibber in it. So this really becomes part of the theatre tradition. So you've got two traditions. You've got the reading tradition, and you've got the performance um, tradition. Well, as I said, there are, you know, folios continue to be produced. First folio is 23, second folio is 1632, third folio after the Restoration, 1663, and the fourth folio in 1685. And they tend to add more plays. So you get things like the Yorkshire tragedy being added, uh, Pericles, which drops in and out. So they become bigger and bigger um, collections. And of course, a lot of these plays aren't by Shakespeare um, at all. So that's the immediate context for the significance of the, the folio edition. I'll say a little bit now about Shakespeare's um, life. 
because Shakespeare is sort of turned into a national legend alongside this. So what do we know? He's baptised on the 26th of April, 1564. It means he could have been born on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd. But it was decided in the 18th century, well, he must have been born on the 23rd of April because that's St. George's Day and St. George is a patron saint of England and Shakespeare is the great um, national poet of England. So he's tied to the national destiny. Okay, but from something which is, you know, possible, it becomes a fact. And now everybody will tell you uh, that Shakespeare was born on the 23rd of April. But it's a mythologization, it's a national mythologization of him. What else do we know about his life? He married Anne Hathaway, not that Anne Hathaway. <laughs> he was only 18, she was um, quite a bit older than him, and she was also pregnant. It was a bit of a shotgun marriage. They had to get married rapidly. And they had daughter Susanna, and then the twins Hamnet, which is a variation of Hamlet, and Judith in 1586. And you might want to see some connection. Hamnet, in fact, died young. Shakespeare subsequently wrote the play Hamlet. Is he dealing with the death of his son? Who knows? Is he that sort of playwright? Did writers really respond to their personal experience in that way um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 16th century, 17th century? Who knows? But it's, it's tempting. It's a tempting thing to see. Uh, but it's certainly, um, I think, there. Shakespeare's own career uh, was really, as an actor originally, he was a man of the stage. He had experience of being on the stage. He was a playwright. He was also a poet, don't forget, although his poems do not appear in the first folio. And he was a theatre manager. And there's also the lost years in which we don't know really what he was doing. People suggest he might have been a school teacher, well, an academic centre like that. Uh, he may, maybe was a sailor. Uh, maybe he was uh, at military service. Uh, might have done all sorts of um, things, but there are certain years, very early on, between leaving Stratford and records in London where there's not really much evidence. But we do certainly, um, the, the other thing we don't have much evidence, oh sorry, this is um, an example of uh, his brother um, saw him act um, in a part um, in a comedy. This is his brother sort of garbled account um, here. I think this is Adam um, in As You, As You Like It, but he's clearly evidenced he was on stage. And it's been suggested through, I mean, fairly recently, he might have played these different parts. Um, I like the idea of him being the ghost in um, the ghost of Hamlet's father in Hamlet, for example, um, or uh, Gaunt in Richard the Second. Sort of interesting ideas about if he is, and it's a big if. Uh, but you know, he's giving himself nice sort of set piece uh, speeches um, here. So we know, we know uh, bits and pieces about Shakespeare's life and career in addition to the plays, but we don't actually have very much um, physical evidence. None of his plays survive in manuscript. We don't have Shakespeare papers, except for this possible passage in a play called Sir Thomas More, that rather like a Hollywood blockbuster, has a huge team of script writers, and Shakespeare might have been one of them, and he might have written this passage. Um, it has sort of certain possibilities. I like the idea of um, shark being used um, as a verb there. Um, but if this is the case, it shows that he writes rapidly, um, doesn't pay much attention to spelling um, or punctuation, which is you know, not uncommon for the time, but was also keen to work with other people. Now, he's not a lone wolf writer, he's a, a very much a collaborator. Um, and the only other, apart from a few signatures, that's his will. Um, there's a famous interpolation which he gives to his wife, his second best bed, which might be, <laughs> it might be an insult to her, <laughs> or it might be um, saying that uh, she should have the, uh, the comfortable, familiar, um, you know, um, nuptial um, bed. Apart from that, what else do we know? That when he died, 
And there's all sorts of anecdotes and rumours. Um, perhaps he went out with Michael Drayton and Ben Johnson and had a merry meeting and, it seems, drank too hard. <laughs> he wouldn't be the first <laughs> poet or writer um, to, uh, to do that. But he was certainly respected. And Ben Johnson, his uh, contemporary, another playwright, uh, he says, I love the man and do honour his memory on this side of idolatry as much as any. He was indeed honest and of an open and free nature. It's a half reference to Othello there. And had an excellent fancy, brave notions and gentle expressions. And in fact, a lot of these, um, if you like, puffs or encomiums appear in the first folio. So the first folio isn't just plays. It's about people saying how great Shakespeare is, about his friends and contemporaries, um, talking about how one should read his work. So it's a bit of a guide on how to approach Shakespeare's plays as reading texts um, as well. But the reading tradition definitely continued, despite the fact that on the stage uh, things were very um, different. So Jacob Thompson, um, an early uh, sort of top tier um, publisher who published um, Milton's Paradise Lost um, in the late 17th century, decided to produce an edition of Shakespeare. And you probably haven't heard of Nicholas Rowe, but at the time, at the beginning of the 18th century, he was a well-known playwright. So he, again, was a professional man of the stage. Uh, popular, successful, had no editorial experience, but that didn't stop him uh, producing um, a six-volume edition of the complete works of Shakespeare without the poems. So these are just the plays. But it's, uh, it's an important edition, this is, because it includes a life of Shakespeare. So very, this is a very early thing. It's very unusual to have a biography of a writer prefaced to their works. And he also takes the, the, the folio plays, most of the plays in the folio are divided into acts, but he divides them into scenes as well, provides places and locations, gathers together the minor characters and gives them names and acts like they're single characters. So it's a very significant edition in sort of making Shakespeare much more regular and appealing to a readership who are beginning to enjoy early novels in which have a consistency in narrative structure and identifiable characters. Now, I said Rowe was popular at the time, not very well known today, but then Thompson had the idea. He said, well, a few years have passed. Let's have another edition. This was his, uh, his nephew, also called Jacob Thompson. We'll get Alexander Pope, who you might have heard of, greatest poet of the early 18th century, um, very uh, controversial, very pugnacious, um, brilliant uh, political satirist. Um, had, uh, he translated the Odyssey and the Iliad, and he then edited the whole of Shakespeare in 1725. So he was a man of huge intellectual energy. And what the publisher, Thompson, is trying to do, he's trying to connect Shakespeare with the best-selling writers of the time. So Shakespeare and Pope, it's a marriage made in heaven for a publisher. You know, you've got the two names joined together. And Pope takes all of Rowe's ideas, but then develops them. So this is a really good addition for people who don't like reading very much, because he puts marks in the margin to show you all the best bits. So you can just skim through and read the, the, what are going to be, frankly, to become like the famous quotations, the well-known uh, passages. He's also quite imaginative um, in how he makes his revisions. But he's basing them all on uh, Nicholas Rowe's work and the, the later folios, which meant that almost immediately this edition was attacked by somebody called Lewis Theobald, or Tybalt, who produced a, a volume, an academic book, pointing out all the errors in Pope's 
version of Hamlet. Interesting he should choose Hamlet. This is sort of early days. And so he attacks everything in Pope's version of Hamlet and saying that Pope, what, what Pope has not done, he hasn't gone back to the early editions. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not a 16th century textual critic. He's um, just a you know, flamboyant, imaginative, um, ingenious writer. And Pope realises that Theobald or Tybalt can do this with every play. So two things happen. The first is that Pope goes on the offensive and he writes his absolutely devastating satire on what he calls the dunces. It's called the Dunciad. It's an attack on bad writing, hack writing, journalism, academics, um, everybody with sort of textual verbal diarrhea, if you <laughs> forgive, the, forgive the phrase. Basically, it's an attack on the worst sort of writing. And he makes Theobald or Tybalt the king of the dunces. All Tybalt had done was to write a critical monograph challenging Pope's edition, and now he becomes king of the dunces in this huge epic satire. And this book is then, um, it's a very controversial, it's, if you haven't read it, please do read it. It's the funniest book of the 18th century, possibly um, in English. It's also unbelievably rude, scurrilous, and scatological. He, he later revises it and places um, somebody else as King of the Dunces, a, a, a playwright. But the other thing that uh, happens is that, of course, the publisher, Jacob Thompson, says, Oi, Theobald, you do the next edition of Shakespeare. Just nine years after Pope's edition, you produce an alternative edition that's going to challenge Pope. So everybody who's bought Pope's edition will now want to buy... Theobald's edition. So you get this sort of sense of dueling editions uh, coming out. Um, then Sir Thomas Hanmer, who'd been Speaker of the House of Commons, dips his toe into these waters, produces a, an Oxford edition which is heavily illustrated but doesn't really have any textual authority. It's very imaginative again. But this is like a coffee table version of Shakespeare for people who like looking at the pictures. But Tonson comes back. Lewis Tibbalt's on his version. William Warburton, who is Pope's friend and literary executor, because Pope is dead by this time, does an edition which then attacks the Theobald version. So it's like they're sort of like fights like, like a game of ping pong. They're going backwards and forwards, um, trying to um, defeat each other, and even though they're all, they're all dying out. Does this carry on? Well, to an extent it does, but then, of course, we get Samuel Johnson, great man of letters of the 18th century, um, known as the great Cham, incredibly uh, well-read, also very pugnacious, we know a huge amount about Johnson's character from James Boswell's Life of Johnson. Boswell used to write down everything Johnson said, even at the dinner table. Even after Johnson had died, he would be at the dinner table when people were talking about Johnson, writing down little stories about him. So there's a lot of um, supposedly direct speech um, in Boswell's Life of Johnson about things that Johnson apparently, apparently said. And Johnson was asked to edit Shakespeare, and he changes the game. This is sort of like a, it's a shift now. Rather than have a go at Warburton or Hanmer, he says, I'm going to gather all of what everybody else has said and have it all as footnotes. So we don't lose anything that Pope said. We don't forget anything that Theobald or Rose said. So this is what's called a a variorum. So it's a, it collects all the various commentators and gives you everything. So it's like a compendium. It's not just complete Shakespeare, it's complete what everybody else has said about Shakespeare. And then this gets expanded with his collaborator George Stevens in 1778, and then Edmund Malone. Um, and this is a very, very late in the day. Says, excuse me, shouldn't we include the poems as well? 
Shakespeare wrote sonnets and he wrote several poems. So those are included um, in, uh, in the 1780 um, version. So there's a, it now becomes much more collaborative and it's as if Johnson and Stevens and Malone are now collaborating not only with each other but with the past. They're collaborating with Hemings and Condell and uh, Rowe and Pope and so forth. So there's a sense of community about this. Now those Stevens and Malone fall out and after Johnson's death produced their own versions. Stevens was an incredibly mischievous person. He was known as the asp, which is a snake. Um, you, you couldn't trust him. He, in his edition, um, any bawdy or rude um, passages that needed to be explained, he attributed them to a clergyman, somebody who really existed. <laughs> He pretended that this clergyman was, was an expert on obscene slang. Um, so he's he very, very scurrilous. Um, and um, they produced their own edition. They, 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 were, they were great collaborators and they fell out. They produced their own competing editions. Uh, but eventually Malone collaborated with Boswell's son and they produced a 21 volume <laughs> edition in 1821 of the. Uh, that's a sort of the ultimate variorum um, edition up to that up to that point, um, really. So you can sort of see how the first folio sort of generates this fantastic interest in how to edit Shakespeare, the different sorts of people. You've got the major writers of the time, like Pope and Johnson, being intimately associated with Shakespeare. So Shakespeare is going to infuse the way that they write, and they're going to in turn give their put their brand onto onto Shakespeare. Johnson had already done this. Johnson's well known for producing um, an early um, dictionary, which includes quotations on how you use words. And who do you think is quoted more than anybody else in this? Shakespeare. So this is as much a work of Shakespeare criticism um, as. Uh, as, as, as any other work of the 18th century, and that's certainly the case with the Oxford English Dictionary still today. So Shakespeare's being held up now um, as a uh, model of the English language, how to use words, uh, the best words. And of course, this is a way of spreading his quotations, um, his, um, his lines, uh, his characters, the titles of his plays. And what's going on in a more international context at this stage, well, it's the rise of the British Empire. And so the language and the textbooks, if you like, of the language are spreading across the world. And Shakespeare is being held up, not only in Britain, but in fact, in all sorts of places where British culture is being introduced. Shakespeare is there in works such as the, the dictionary. Back in England, of course, this is going to lead to a renewed interest in Shakespeare's life and times. And so you get the beginnings of literary tourism. Now, there'd been a story that Shakespeare had gone out drinking and fallen asleep underneath a crab tree. And this crab tree became a tourist attraction just outside Stratford. And so people would go and visit it. And they thought, well, I'll just take a leaf, and I'll just take a twig, and I'll just take a branch, and then there was no tree left at all. In a more extreme way, the same thing happened with his house. First of all, it happened with a mulberry tree in the garden, which Shakespeare supposedly planted. People wanted to have a souvenirs from the mulberry tree. And the Reverend Gastrel, who had um, bought the, the house, chopped it down. He then sold it um, to a local uh, woodworker, who then spent the rest of his life making objects out of this um, infinite <laughs> mulberry tree. People, of course, wanted to see the house. So the same clergyman then knocked the house down because he was fed up with people peering over the wall and knocking, in, knocking on his door. But they still came to see the hole in the ground um, after that. 
You could go to Stratford and you could see um, Shakespeare's pencil case. That's, that's not really his, <laughs> his pencil case. You can see his inkwell, uh, you can see his gloves, you can sit in the, in the chair uh, that, he, um, that he supposedly sat in. Um, some of the mulberry tree things do come up on eBay um, occasionally. Um, you know, how authentic is something like that? A <laughs> Shakespearean teapot made out of a wood that um, he supposedly planted. Uh, if you went to Stratford in the 18th century, you could also meet a dog, a spotted dog that was supposedly descended from one of Shakespeare's own dogs, <laughs> again. So this sort of shows the sort of extraordinary um, need to identify personally with Shakespeare. So alongside the performing tradition, the reading tradition, there's a growing personal uh, tradition um, here um, as well. So, of course, the answers, one of the answers to that is can we find more about Shakespeare, ideally more plays? Well, the same Theobald um, published something called The Double Falsehood, which he claimed was a new Shakespeare play, never included it in his own copy of the works. It appears possibly um, to be a late 17th century rewrite of Shakespeare's lost play, Cardinio. It's possible, it has a few uh, lines, allusions, a similar uh, supposed plot to that. But that's got a great deal of interest um, in recent times. You can now get a, um, a paperback, The Double Falsehood, um, but it doesn't actually say it's by, it's in the Arden Shakespeare, but doesn't say Shakespeare <laughs> as, um, as author um, there. Um, Towards the end of the 18th century, in the 17, in 1790s, a whole horde of Shakespeare manuscripts was in fact discovered. Manuscripts of King Lear, um, of Hamlet, uh, much business correspondence, uh, memoirs, and letters to Anne Hathaway, including a lock of Shakespeare's own hair. And here you have them. Is there in heaven aught more rare than thou, sweet nymph of Avon fair? <laughs> now, these were forgeries. It was quite remarkable. The forgery is done by a teenager. And they managed to fool um, many of the, the great and the good at the time, including James Boswell, who actually fell to his knees before the papers and said, I thank God that I've lived to see this day. And they're taken very, very seriously. And in fact, a new play... Vortigen was actually performed, although it was eventually howled uh, from, the, uh, from the stage. So it actually sort of demonstrates sort of the increasing reputation and need to identify, um, I think, with, uh, with Shakespeare. And so this is the 1790s. This really comes of age uh, with the Romantic uh, movement. Uh, so Samuel Taylor Coleridge, William Wordsworth, um, published lyrical ballads right at the end of the 18th century. And then you get romantic poets um, such as Robert Southey, um, Lord Byron, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, uh, John Keats, um, and so forth. And there's a very strong personal identification with um, Shakespeare um, through the romantic imagination. So Coleridge said, I have a smack of Hamlet about me. You know, they all want to be Hamlet. Everybody wants to be Hamlet. This is sort of their, their desire, is to be just like, just like Hamlet. You also get this idea uh, that Shakespeare can't be performed. The plays are too big. They're too powerful, too moving to be performed. So they can only be staged in the theatre of the mind. So you get this idea that, you know, and the, the more imagination you have, um, the, the more well-read you are, the better sort of virtual performance you're going to be able to, uh, to actually um, experience. Um, and romantics such as uh, John Keats um, is always quoting from Shakespeare, um, not only um, in, his, um, in his letters, uh, but also um, in, in his poetry. Um, his, um, his brother Tom um, died of tuberculosis. Um, and uh, he actually underlines in King Lear um, a line that uh, uh, the nightingale haunts, so, sorry, that the foul fiend haunts poor Tom in the voice of the nightingale. 
And so that seems to then lead into Keats's um, Ode to a Nightingale. So there's these interesting relations um, there, I think. And alongside this, um, the, romantic, the, the British Romantics had a strong relationship with, the, uh, with, with German Romanticism. And from the late 18th century, with Augustus Schlegel and then Ludwig Tieck uh, and Tieck's family, there's a really concerted um, German um, program to translate Shakespeare into German and then really to see Shakespeare as embodying a German spirit. In fact, I was reading something the other day which suggests that um, in any given year today, there are more performances of Shakespeare in Germany than there are um, in, the, in the UK. So there's a very strong identification uh, that, uh, uh, that, we're, that we're experiencing here. And of course, this carries on through the 19th century and becomes global, as we'll see, um, I think, um, in, a, um, in a moment. Uh, but I just want to say something about that idea of the identification with Hamlet. Uh, because Hamlet seems to sort of keep coming back. It's interesting that Hamlet was a play that Louis Theobald decided to attack Pope's edition on. Now, Hamlet is the touchstone uh, for the Romantics. And Hamlet, of course, is one of the most identifiable characters, one of the most identifiable scenes. You've got Laurence Olivier uh, and, and Yorick, um, as you might, might expect. It's arguable how old Hamlet is in a play, but he's generally considered to be played uh, the character of a young of a young man doesn't have to be. Um, Olivier was 31 when he played him. Um, a couple of years ago, Ian McKellen uh, was with 82 when he played um, Hamlet. So we're now getting not only um, gender and race blind performances, but also age blind performances. Uh, but you'll you'll perhaps know a little bit about Hamlet. In one of the Bard's best thought of tragedies, our insistent hero Hamlet queries on two fronts about how life turns rotten. Anybody know the significance of those lines? I don't know, Edward, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'll just read them in. in one of the Bard's best thought of tragedies, our insistent hero Hamlet queries on two fronts about how life turns rotten. It's not a bad summary of one of the speeches, to be or not to be. In fact, this is an anagram of that. <laughs> now, I don't know how long it took <laughs> for the <laughs> uh, composer of that anagram to, to spread. It just goes to show the sort of tenacity that Shakespeare has on the um, imagination and the ingenuity of people to decide you're going to turn those lines into an anagram um, and uh, make, it, make it sensible. And that carries on into various adaptations, um, I think. So um, you'll be familiar, perhaps, with um, how Romeo and Juliet is, uh, provides a basis for a musical such as West Side Story. Um, but there's also um, cult movies such as With Nail and I um, that are very much saturated with references particularly to Hamlet. If you haven't seen this film, I strongly recommend that you do so. Um, one of the best British movies um, made, um, and one which uh, is um, very characteristically about the Shakespearean um, culture. This one's loosely based on parts of Hamlet. You might have heard of <laughs> that one. <laughs> well, perhaps you're and uh, your children have. The very interesting version of Othello, just called O, uh, which uh, is about a um, basketball um, player and his uh, relationship uh, with his, his girlfriend um, and his supposedly best friend, obviously based on Othello. Um, though the Japanese films uh, ran uh, based on King Lear, um, Throne of Blood uh, based on uh, Macbeth, and even um, something uh, such as uh, the Forbidden Planet, <laughs> Return to the Forbidden Planet, which uh, does have some affinities with the Tempest insofar as it's a group of uh, individuals and characters um, who are, um, you know, 
enclosed, isolated in the same place. So I just wanted to give you a sort of a sense of the past sort of 400 years um, there, and really the significance of the first folio, that without the first folio, we would not have, for example, Macbeth, and therefore not, not Throne of Blood, but also how the first folio generates, um, helps to generate the Shakespeare culture. And because of its status as a book, influences the spread of his works, um, not only uh, throughout Britain, but in fact, um, internationally. Now, what we're going to do now is uh, think of the, uh, the more, not the temporal, but the more global um, context. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Edward Wilson um, Lee, um, who's going to be talking to us um, about his recent book, um, Shakespeare in Swahili Land. Um, Edward is an English literature academic at Sydney Sussex College at Cambridge and a specialist in literature and history of the book in the early modern period. He's a son of, a wild, of wildlife conservationists and was born in the same Midwest farming town as his father. And after spending the early part of his life in Kenya and Switzerland, studied at University College London and completed a doctorate at Oxford and Cambridge. As I say, he's the author of Shakespeare in Swahili Land, Adventures with the Ever-Living Poet, which was a finalist for the William Surian International Prize for Writing for Nonfiction in 2018, and also the author, among other things, of A History of Water, being an account of a murder, an epic, and two visions of global history, which was a Times History Book of the Year 2022. So I'd like to invite um, Edward to take the stage now and to talk to us about Shakespeare and Swahili land, and then we'll take questions uh, for, for both of us at the end. So thank you.